SMT Nation, we back. We're covering two stories here today. The first one is from AT&T, and there's a couple of, I guess, good things that I think consumers can be happy to kind of look forward to in the future. And then the second piece of news is actually about the iPhone 14 and Dish, and that's good news too. All right, so we'll start first with the AT&T story. Their SVP of finance touts the company's efforts at transparency. In and of itself, the title, not really all that groundbreaking or anything like that, but the pieces within this that Linda Hardesty was able to put in are kind of interesting here. All right, so um, the first part of the article just kind of highlights how the carrier, AT&T, has kind of changed their ways following, um, there was like an open letter. You guys might remember this. We covered it here on the channel. When a major investment firm named Elliott Management wrote an open letter to the board of directors at at and giving them a, essentially a list of things they could do to make the company better and what they wanted to see change, which was kind of random and unusual. But like at and wasn't really moving in the right direction. You know, the all the stuff with the acquisitions with media and how the company was operating, they felt like things could be improved on a lot of different levels. Anyways, Elliott Management ended up put it, pulling out their entire investment and selling all their shares in the company. But there were a lot of things in that list that made sense. And AT&T took it to heart and they changed the way that they operate their business on a lot of levels. Uh, so a lot of what they do now, they talk about bringing more transparency and more consistency in their messaging to the investor community. And if you look at the, I guess the, the, the ticker price, the, the, you know, what it costs to buy a share of AT&T, it has consistently dipped and dropped even with all these changes. But I will tell you guys that at and has improved on a lot of levels, right? They have been adding net ads and subscribers every quarter for basically the last, you know, two years, two full years and some additional cues. Uh, they are growing and they're ultra competitive when it comes to promotions and getting customers. And, you know, they're like the profitable growth version of T-Mobile, like T-Mobile doesn't make the profit or the ARPU that AT&T does. And Verizon makes ARPU and tons of profit margins, but they don't grow. So they're like kind of like the best case scenario. If you're looking at an investor, the only problem is they've accrued so much debt over the last five to 10 years with these horrible acquisitions from the media side, but they sold it all off. They've streamlined their business, their focus right now, and the messaging from the uh, company is here. The mantra is 5G and fiber. Now, the one thing I want to mention is what they've been able to do with this new mantra and this new focus, putting their money towards the core business of what they do and is here, all right? When asked about at and C-band deployment, the SVP of finance here mentioning uh, that the company has surpassed its target of 70 million pops halfway through the year. Folks, they did not start building C-band literally until like April. That's when I started seeing upgrades in my city. And my city is pretty far along for how early it's been in the in the build. So I, you know, when I look at this raising of the goal to 100 million pops, adding 30 million pops is, that's nothing to sneeze at, right? There's nothing to scoff at. And I think they could probably hit this without any issue, right? You start covering entire towns and, and major markets, so my city is a, or my PEA, my market is number 14, I believe. There's at least another dozen or so cities that are just like mine that are getting built to the same pace. They're probably going to start adding some more cities similarly and get those ramped up pretty good by the end of the year. I think 100 million pops of C-band is legitimately reachable. And then here, uh, went on to discuss the fixed wireless access piece. 5G home internet and such, you know, they haven't really gotten on board with this and they don't like that model as a, as a grand scale option for their business. Their focus has been fiber. They're upgrading 5G and they're kind of rolling with that. And it makes sense. It's a far superior technology, but fiber is resource intensive, labor intensive, planning intensive, a lot of obstacles and barriers, things that can go wrong. It's much more challenging than upgrading tower sites, uh, but it, does it is it is an inferior product to fiber so they're all in on fiber they can monetize enterprise 
you know, running it to their own uh, cell towers, fiber to the premise. It's a long-term investment that's going to pay out for them. They're focusing on that. But he said here that he, and it, and it sounds like they kind of left the door open, right? He's, you know, in, in speaking about fiber and stuff, he said, in markets where there's an attractive return, we think it's the best technology. We have an advantage because we've got the largest fiber network. All true, all fact. But he goes on to say, in time, you might see more fixed wireless access from us. We understand the opportunity. That kind of feels like they leave the door open for the opportunity, maybe potentially down the road, as the fiber investment, fiber to premise, branching out all these little projects may not be cost effective for them, but they could open up potentially a fixed wireless option in some instances. Again, it's not ever going to be a major component of business strategy for them. But them leaving the door open here means that they see the opportunity and that it could be something that they could explore at a later time because, you know, Verizon has added a lot of subscribers and so has T-Mobile. So there may be pockets and situations where it could work for them. So maybe maybe we shouldn't be completely, you know, standoffish about their efforts to maybe someday do some more fixed wireless access. I just don't know if it's going to be the dedicated fixed wireless access with those access points and they put up the dedicated hardware in people's homes and premise, or are they actually going to do it over their mobile network? They seem to not want to do it over their mobile network. Leave all those assets and that functionality by itself. Don't take capacity away from the mobile user. That's, that's going to be you know, what remains to be seen. Do they ever actually utilize their mobile network for a multi-purpose like the other two? We'll see, but interesting uh, insight from their SVP of finance. Uh, comment down below what you guys think of that. Uh, next piece of news, this one is from Fierce Wireless as well. I'll, I'll put links to the uh, both these articles in the description. iPhone 14 support for Band 70. Big win for Dish. I agree. Totally agree. This is huge. All right. For those of you that are unaware, Dish is the new fourth carrier. They're coming in to replace the consumed, chopped up, and spit out Sprint, <laughs> and with Sprint gone, we would like to see a fourth carrier replacement. Dish comes into play here. Uh, they are just focused on building out a network. They're trying to figure out what they're doing in retail. And up till now, they've had a hard time figuring out what they're going to do with phone handset hardware to consumers that supports all elements of their network. They have N71, like T-Mobile, the 600 megahertz. They have, uh, as well, they have... Um, the AWS situation that's band 66 on the LTE side, but on the 5G side, we see N70 is going to be the focus. And they've got a couple of pieces and parts here for their band 70 or N70. They've got a couple of different blocks of AWS with like dedicated upload, dedicated download, and then a paired channel as well. So what they want to do is they want to be able to utilize this and they haven't been able to really do it yet because band 70 has not been included in any of the handsets and the phones that are on the market, not the Motorola Edge Plus or, or anything. So they, they've been selling the S22 in their beta testing program uh, with Boost Infinite and uh, Project Genesis and all that. But now we have our first device that is the most important device to get the Band 70, and that's the iPhone, iPhone 14. So now they can sell this phone leverage this phone as the phone that can connect to all elements of their network. And remember, it's eSIM only here in America. And the reason that's important is because Dish is going to have to easily convert people where they can add a SIM, an eSIM, to this iPhone. And Dish can leverage that as people can try the network, uh, you know, as soon as it, whether it's beta or out of beta in its, you know, its general launch, and then people can use the service. They have to start generating revenue. They have to get in, go, get retail going and sales because they have to monetize their network and use that capital, raise capital to build more. Uh, they're, they're currently 20 plus, 20 or so percent of the nation covered and pops. They've got to get to like 70% here in the near future, like within the next year or so. So they've got work to do and they need to generate capital or else they're not going to get there and they're going to be, you know, getting hit with fines. And obviously this is their new business. So they <laughs> they have to succeed or else, you know, they're going to fail and go out of business. All right. So um, looking also at the iPhone 
there's N14, which is AT&T, right? So whenever AT&T decides to take that first net low band, 700 megahertz, go on R, they can. Uh, you got the band 26 support, which used to be Sprint, and it's actually T-Mobile now, but we we thought that Dish was going to be buying it. They can through the DOJ concessions. Uh, they can buy it from T-Mobile, but they don't have the capital. They don't seem like they want to buy it. All right, so we'll continue to wait to see if that happens. But, uh, you know, legacy devices are not going to be connecting to this N70 stuff. And by legacy, I mean like anything before this phone, right? So these are important things to consider as you experiment and try to do your BYOD or add eSIM capabilities with these phones. Uh, it looks like this is going to be a double whammy. This is going to help the user. This is going to allow the user to try Dish and get full support for everything going on with dish all right so you need you know n71 for dish for the low band that's important for their coverage and then you've now you've got the n70 piece which is their capacity layer the true capacity layer as they do have a sizable chunk of spectrum there and with not a lot of users on the network folks it's probably going to be pretty fast all right can we see 300 megabits per, uh, per second consistency where you know dishnet is going where boost infinite is going I think that's very realistic, you know, as, as long as you're aggregating the N70 with the N71. And, you know, they, they've got all the radios up here in Cleveland. I can't wait to try the service. Uh, they do have some CBRS licenses. They could start hanging radios and antennas for that as they kind of go along. And, uh, you know, they did buy some DOD spectrum, the lower block of the C-band, but they haven't put up any radios and antennas yet for it. Uh, 3450. Uh, so that three gigahertz and that's 40 megahertz of it. I think mostly national 30 or 40 in most cases that can be fast too. So they, there will be markets where they've got like 20 megahertz of low band. And then the AWS at like 40, 45 megahertz plus an additional 40 megahertz of DOD. You're seeing hundred megahertz of spectrum on air. No problem. Um, and with CBRS, should they do that? I mean, they, I think they've got 10, 20 megahertz of it in a lot of places. Who knows? Sky's the limit when you go standalone 5G like Dish, Greenfield 5G network, the flexibility, the latency, all that stuff that we could see some cool, interesting things. I'm excited to try it here, folks. When it comes to technology, ORAN, VRAN, all these new te uh, technologies, the ceiling for Dish is really high when it comes to the network. We just need them to build it. We need them to launch it. And now we got phones to support all of that. So we'll see what happens. Excited. I am. I'm a I'm a tech guy. Uh, not necessarily a brand guy, but a network tech enthusiast. Uh, you guys can comment down below what you think of this. How big of a deal is it for, you know, the the Dish network, uh, the consumer, and those types of things, and then also the AT and T story. Sound off in the comment section below. You all the voice of the people, the S and T nation. Let your voice be heard. Like, share, subscribe for more, and turn on that bell notification icon to never miss an upload. Links are in the description for my Twitter, my Gmail address for all business inquiries, and my Patreon page if you want to support us and get early access to content and exclusive videos not found anywhere else. Thanks for watching. See you on the next one. Peace.